you everyone for coming today. I really appreciate you uh, being here to uh, see uh, what the school and child care IPM team is, is focused on in terms of gopher control. Uh, so a little bit of background about myself. There we go. Uh, my wife and I are avid hikers. So I've shown here on summits both on the east and the west coast. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a single picture of myself from my previous job, which was as a commercial pest management professional. Uh, so back then I used to have, you know, customers and accounts, and now my customer is all of the school sites in California. And what you guys have hired me to do is the directive that I put here on the screen, and, and this will be some of the most text you'll see from me today. So I want to read this to you because it's, it's important to me. It is the policy of the state that effective, least toxic pest management practices should be the preferred method of managing pests at school sites, and that the state, in order to reduce children's exposure to toxic pesticides, shall take the necessary steps to facilitate the adoption of effective, least toxic, pest management practices at school sites. So we get our information from a database. In 2015, a new requirement kicked in that said not only do businesses have to report what pesticides they use at schools, but also school district staff have to report their pesticides as well. So we sent out a reminder. Our, our deadline for reporting is at the end of January annually. And everything is done on paper, so we get an awful lot of mail that starts to come in. And for about two and a half weeks of the year, we get about this much mail on the daily. For the first three months after that comes in, we're in a process called error corrections. So what we do here is that the data entry team gets together and they look through all the paperwork and they try to find what forms are not able to be processed. And then they're going to get in touch with the people who submitted those forms to uh, get them corrected. So that's done by phone or email. And I, I want to thank the data entry team, most of whom are here today. Uh, they have resolved in the past two years 298 out of 338 error corrections for a, a very high 88% resolution rate that I'm really proud of. So after they do error corrections, they go into data entry, and it all happens here in the super cube where we stuff four people into one, one double wide cube. Uh, and so they, uh, they are generally entering at least 180 individual pesticide applications per day. I want to give them a shout out too, again, uh, just last month they set a new data entry record it hadn't been broken since December 2010. They entered over 17,000 reports in one month. Each report is hand numbered. And that means that we take all this paperwork, we process it into effectively a library or a card catalog, if you will, of school pesticide use. Now this is where it gets exciting for me because this is my tool. So what do I do with this? Well. I like to make visualizations. So on this slide, you can see everyone who sent us reports for 2015. The orange lines are from school districts, and the blue lines are from companies. The thicker the line on this map is, the more reports we received. So our high population areas, the Bay Area, LA area, lots of reports coming in. Uh, the east side of the state and the north, uh, a little less dense and a little less coverage there. What is being applied? Well, this graphic, every single bubble here indicates a different active ingredient. And the size of the bubble tells you how many applications of that active ingredient were made. And that's the fairest way right now for us to compare uh, different actives. So our number one winner, the biggest circle there, is glyphosate. So in 2015, there were more applications of glyphosate than any other product. But I want to point out some others, actually, that are important to this talk, and that is strychnine, the blue bubble, number two. Above it, in yellow, difacinone, about half of that bubble is used for targeting gophers. 
And then in the bottom left, number 10 in red, is aluminum phosphide, almost exclusively used for targeting gophers. So two and a half of our top 10 bubbles here are all for gophers. Where are these applications taking place? Well, if you look at the graph, just between athletic field, building exterior, and landscape outdoor, all three outdoor locations, we see over 50% of our applications occurring. And when? What this graph is going to show you is across the x-axis, we've got January through December. And the different colors indicate different days. So at the top, Sunday is in blue, and then all the way down to Saturday at the bottom. Almost a quarter of all school pesticide applications in the state occurred on a Saturday, and that's great, right? We're reducing risk by doing these applications, no matter what they are, when the students aren't on campus, or at least less of the students are on campus. So I gave you who, what, where, and when. And then the real question is why? And that's pretty difficult to put into a single graphic. And the reason is gophers, okay? A lot of people in California think of the gopher as this kind of cute, cuddly little you know, mammal, right? He looks, he looks quite friendly. But gophers can do a lot of damage. Gophers live their whole life underground in a closed burrow system. And what's the big engineering problem with digging a tunnel, digging a burrow? It's where do you put all that dirt, right? So what the gopher does is it kicks out all that dirt, sometimes up to five pounds per mound. And what's going on here is the gopher, the gopher is running its burrow alongside that concrete edge. And as it goes down the line, it's kicking all that dirt out as it makes the tunnel. Three to six for a big male, maybe up to 10 mounds a day. So you don't want to be a loafer when it comes to this gopher, right? You got to take care of that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, they, they do some good damage to uh, athletic fields. And if we get a closer look at what's going on here, Here's a mound that's been kind of knocked down and, and uh, weathered over time. You can see the hole where the gopher pushed the dirt out of and then the kind of mud splatter where the grass won't grow. So the real problem with this pest, other than messing up irrigation systems and damaging landscapes, making them look bad, is the slip, trip, and fall hazard for student athletes. That's where we really see gophers causing a, a problem for humans. So this is how I think of gophers, you know, a little less cuddly looking than what I showed you before. All right, so how do we turn this half pound of landscape menace on the left hand side into the half pound of landscape fertilizer on the right hand side? <laughs> There's three main active ingredients that we use to do this. On here, I've made them sized by the amount of use. So in the upper right, we've got strychnine. Okay, strychnine is related to caffeine. It's a bitter alkaloid. It causes convulsions, and that's how it kills you. In the bottom left, I'm blocking my own view, is aluminum phosphide. Now what happens there is aluminum phosphide reacts with water to release phosphine gas. And uh, I don't know if there's any Breaking Bad fans in the room, but there's a scene in Breaking Bad where the main character creates phosphine gas in order to escape these bad guys, right? It's highly toxic. In the bottom right, we've got a first generation rodenticide known as diphasino. Uh, as you can see, it's very small and, and not very popular. So let's look at the use of these actives over time. If you look back to 2002 and you go to that top line, that's the total number of applications. And you can see it tracks really nicely with the aluminum phosphide. And that goes all the way up through about 2010. And for those of you who are not too familiar with this particular AI, back in 2010 in Layton, Utah, an applicator applied too much aluminum phosphide too close to a house. And unfortunately, uh, two young girls died. And that created a lot of that created a lot of uh, emotion and uh, controversy, and there were some label changes that came out of that, which were good. And correlation doesn't equal causation, but you can see in the aftermath, the aluminum phosphide use went down. But the total kept climbing, and the reason is that strychnine came along and took its place. 
So just to show you some of the kind of cool, fun stuff we can do with the database, as the years tick by here, you're going to see the aluminum phosphide in red, right? And the bigger the circle is, the more use. The aluminum phosphide is kind of dominating the scene until we get to about 2010, and then we see the switch. And the strychnine there in green starts to come along. Okay. I can look at the database and make a map that will show you exactly where, which districts are doing the most gopher targeting. So we've got John from Manteca here today. Manteca Unified is right here. Okay? And the fact that they were dark back in 2015 means that they were using quite a bit of gopher targeting toxins. Uh, we can also see there's a good amount going on down south. Here's Weston Ranch High School. This is John's uh, site. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but I, I do want to show you a calendar, the way that I look at these applications. So this was the application calendar in 2015 at Weston Ranch. So back in January, in that pinkish color, we had one application of the difacinone, the not popular product. And then we start switching to blue. All those blue squares are when strychnine was applied, right? Strychnine is that bitter alkaloid. We put it in a bait product and it goes underground in the burrow. Then as we get into October and November, we start to see a few applications of aluminum phosphide in red, right? So at this point, we've been treating the gopher problem all year long. Here's another middle school uh, down in Southern California. I'm going to show you their 2016 gopher targeting data. So that's, this school is doing their own gopher control. They're doing most of the applications on Saturdays. That's good. Oh, Sundays. Uh, well, Saturdays and Sundays. That's good. Um, but once again, we see over time, we get a repeated applications. And so what I like to say is, I don't view this as a pesticide problem. I view this as a pest management problem where the symptom is repeated pesticide applications. Let's take a look at a couple more examples. Here's another middle school. It's, it's not quite as clear, so you might not be able to see. It's pretty well surrounded by suburbia, not ag land like John has to deal with. They had a contractor doing their gopher control, and he was coming out on Mondays, and we're looking at you know what, what is a pretty standard schedule for a lot of schools right now. Uh, once a week, strychnine bait applications targeting gophers. Now for 2016, this school is, is in the top three for most applications. This is a high school, and their calendar looks like this. So, red, once again, is the aluminum phosphide. That's what, you know, what reacts with water to release phosphine gas. Blue is still strychnine. On the dates that I circled there in March and November, that's where the contractor came out and applied aluminum phosphide, the fumigant, on the same day that the school district staff went out and used strychnine bait. Now, if you just think about how those different products work, right? We've got a gas that is, is toxic, that uh, if you breathe it in, it'll kill the gopher, right? But it doesn't last that long. And we've got a bait that the gopher has to consume, right? So uh, I kind of call this going all in on gopher control, right? And I don't think you should play pesticide poker with these gophers. No laughs on that one, huh? Oh, well. Okay, let me tell you why I think, uh, why I think that uh, these, these pesticide applications are not getting the job done the way we want them to. So here's a picture I showed you earlier, right? Damage on a football field. This is a study done in Davis in 1957 to map gopher burrows. Okay, and I'm gonna walk over here and take a second because the pointer's not working. See these black tubes here? That's where the gopher has sealed off the tunnel. So effectively, all of this open tunnel over here is cut off from the main burrow system over here. Now the ends in this area indicate nest areas. Gophers also have uh, fecal chambers, poo rooms, if you will, and they, uh, they have uh, chambers where they give birth. They have all kinds of complicated things going on. In fact, if you look at the scale, this particular burrow, and they're all very unique, is 20 feet long and 8 feet wide. 
which gives you for this one gopher a total damage area of about 160 square feet. Now, this, this thing is complicated, right? It's a little hard to look at, so I tried to break it down. And what I did is I, I flattened it out here and I put it on grass so you can see what I'm talking about. So those mounds, I put little gopher mounds so we can see clearly. Now, if you look at this situation, you got four mounds, two of them on the left-hand side. You may think that this is a great spot to do your treatment, right? But because you don't know what's going on underground, you may be applying pesticides in a part of the burrow system where the gopher can't even access anymore, right? And I'm not the only one who thinks that this is uh, part of the problem. I've got backup from uh, Roger Baldwin of UC Davis. I pulled three quotes uh, from a paper he wrote back in 2014. So here's what he says. This study clearly indicates a substantial increase in capture proficiency of pocket gophers with as little as three days experience by novice trappers given limited training. And by limited training, in the paper he actually means 15 minutes. Training sessions should focus largely on correct identification of active burrow systems. I recommend that where feasible, trapping be included in integrated pest management programs for pocket gophers given its high efficacy and lack of secondary toxicity risk. So we took this to heart and we've been training on gopher trapping uh, since Lisa caught her first gopher here. Before since before that. So here's Lisa, she, you're going to hear from her today. She, uh, she doesn't look too pleased to have the gopher too close to her. And we've actually been going all over the state and showing this technique, right? From 2010 in Ukiah, all the way through 2013 in Templeton, 2015 in Pacific Grove. We just hold, held a gopher specialty workshop or two. Um, so we've been getting out there and getting the word out, trying to show, look at how happy you make these school people when you show them how they can deal with this problem. Okay, so I asked Phil, one of our trainers, I said, Phil, if this, train, if this trapping works so good, then why doesn't everybody do it? And he said, you have to find the right people, right? So when I look at this picture from one of our workshops, and I see, you know, the guys at the end with the big old smiles, bare hand in it there, and then I look a little bit closer to me, right, and I see an individual who's a little more hesitant to uh, get near this gopher, right? You can pretty well pick out who may be the right person for the job. Okay. I want to thank Rob Corley of CDE. This is an email I got from him in April. He's been helping me out a lot to spread the word, right? There's only so much I can do from my cubicle here in Sacramento. So he said, in Riverside, we had a good discussion about the use of gopher poisons on school fields. Several of the districts were surprised there was so much use and exchanged information on contract trappers who have been successful at other districts. A small step but directly from your data, okay? Sometimes people don't come to us, or sorry, sometimes people go and, you know, they go for us, like Rob, and sometimes people come to us. So I want to show you something that the database was able to provide for us. So here's an email I sent in late November last year. Hey team, the idea came up a couple weeks back to invite specific districts who use the most gopher targeting pesticide to the gopher workshop. Below is the list of the top 15. Looks like a lot from down south. What do you think would be a good timeline for the invitation? Now the reason I circled number nine there is because three months after I sent this email, Palos Verdes Peninsula School District came to us and said, hey, we would like to look into some alternative management practices for gophers, right? We're having some trouble. We're not getting control. How can you help us? And uh, I got an update from them just in the past week that uh, they are doing trapping and another technique that John's going to talk about, and they're going to stick with it because it's working. So uh, sometimes people go out and talk for us, and sometimes uh, people come to us. So like I said, you know, there's only so much I can do from my cubicle, but now you know what's going on out there. So I really appreciate it if you know of schools that are having problems with gophers, uh, if you can connect us to people who have had success or who want to learn more, uh, that's how you can really help us to uh, 
decrease the risk associated with gopher control all across California school sites. So uh, I will give you one last little update here. For 2016, uh, we're about 80% done with data entry. These are the school districts that are popping out to us. The number one district, we're going to be going down there in early November for a site visit, going to show them some of all our, our alternatives. So slowly but surely, we're going to try to help people uh, manage their gophers better. So with that, I'll throw up my little disclaimer there. And then I want to say a quick thank you to John Lopez for all he's done for our program. Uh, he's going to be hosting a workshop next week. He's up here talking. And uh, I really appreciate that. So thank you, John. Contact for a while. Uh, we he had mentioned about a, a, a graph that he had put together on uh, the pesticide use, and uh, when he saw that our graph had gone really down, as he goes, "What are you guys doing?" And uh, I said, "Well, we're trapping now." And he goes, "Yeah, do you mind if we come down and take a look at it and what you're doing?" And so they came down, and we, uh, you know, I showed him the the uh, box that we have. Uh, that we supplied with our guys, with our crew, and it has approximately um, 40 to 50 traps in the box. And uh, what they do is they go out and uh, trap them by hand. They'll go out and to each site, they get assigned a site, and uh, go out to the sites and trap them. Okay, like Eric had mentioned, uh, these are the school sites uh, that uh, we take care of in our, our department. And uh, I'd like to see there's a lot of coverage, a lot of area that we, our guys have to cover. We have nine guys in our crew that uh, handle these sites. Uh, the, the issues we're having with the school, as you can see, where all of the agriculture, uh, the fields next to us, and it seemed like when they would disc and get the fields ready is when the population would increase on our fields. And trapping was, uh, we were having to work on it a lot, a lot more on it. It, may, it makes it hard for our the site there. And as you can see, the damage that it causes uh, on our sports fields. Uh, the, what gets hidden are the, are the tunnels. Some of the tunnels are pretty shallow, and when you go to walk them, they collapse, and uh, that's where we get our twisted ankles and, um, for the students. And more of the mounds, the problems that we're having. And this is this was a crazy picture. This this guy just came out of the hole, and it's like was telling me, "Yeah, get away from me! <laughs> You're in my territory." And you can see the, all the damage. I mean, the the graphics that Eric was showing us, and that's exactly what it looks like. It's this is crazy. All the damage that they were doing. So. We had a contractor that was coming out and taking care of our, our lots for us. And it just didn't seem to be working. He either had an excuse that it was, the weather was too dry, the ground was too dry, it wasn't getting, it wasn't getting activated, the, the chemical. And then it was either too wet, and uh, just, just, they, it just wasn't working. They we would they'd come out to the sites and we'd get all, all our tags, and then we were at this site this day, and this site this site. We put down this much down, and. And uh, nothing was happening. You know, they were still getting mounds and gopher holes. And so uh, they, uh, the district wanted, hey, we need to do something about this. You know, if, if you were having this contractor come out and do the work, we're, uh, we're not getting the results. I said, well, we can, on this side here, uh, another alternative was to get some of the trap for us. So we had a contractor come out and he, you know, says, okay, I can take care of this field for this price, this price. So I went back with a quote, and uh, you know, and my boss says, well, that's quite a bit of money for us for like a week, weeks worth of work. And I, you know, says, hey, we can do that. Our department can do that. You know, so we went out and purchased, you know, two, three, four hundred traps and containers, and actually had the contractor show us, hey, how do we? 
How do we trap? How do we, what do we look for? Where do we put the, our traps in the tunnels? And um, we started trapping and hey, this is working. I mean, we were getting 200, 300, 400 gophers up out of this site here. And so we ended up starting to do it on our other sites and was very, very successful with it. It's the, we actually turned the money that we were paying the contractor, put it back into our site, into our crew, and we're paying them overtime. We give them two hours overtime a day after work and they go out and set traps. And it was really, it worked really well. It worked really well. I think this was here. I think they happened to be on the site and as we were walking there was one of the boards there and the gopher was underneath it. We, what we do is we will dig the hole out and it's said it's a box trap. It's a Victor box trap. And um, you know we'll set it down, cover it with a board and put the grass in the hole that we've dug out and put a flag so we can identify it um, the next day to pick up the traps, check them. And we just happened to walk by and they had set them out that morning. Uh, this was just recently purchased by our district. It's the perk machine, and it works really well. We, uh, you know, if there's a, an area like where it had multiple holes, we park this uh, the machine right almost in the middle of it, and then we're able to go 50 feet all the way around to. Uh, and probe into the ground and uh, kill the gophers, gas them. It's actually a compressor that, uh, it's a motor that goes through the cooling system and there's a holding tank uh, that uh, holds, holds the, the gas in and then just, it keeps it constant pressure in there so as you're working, it's, as it gets the tank, it's low, it builds up and just keeps everything constant. And here are the results from the either, well, this is trapping in here, uh, but it works out really well. The trapping is it's awesome. And it's one of our sports fields. Actually, that's a sports field where you saw all the main tunnels. That's that same field. Is that it? You gotta tell us what success is. <laughs> Traffic. I mean, it's uh, we're getting the results for the school sites are pleased uh, with us. You know, they're glad that we're out there trapping and seeing that, and they're they're all involved. You got students, the uh, the staff, and they you know they know they if there's a flag with the out there, they know to stay away, and so they all they all pretty well know us out there. But it works out really well. You guys really enjoy it. Thanks, John. <laughs>
Um, so, like I said, we're a training and outreach program. Oh, and I also want to mention, um, this is a new tool we're using. It's a story map, so it's a visual way to tell a story. Um, so, if there are any hiccups, it's because I'm doing this for the first time too. But we'll go, we'll go for the ride together. Um, so, we're an outreach and training program focusing on school integrated pest management and healthy school deck compliance. And some of our activities include IPM workshops, um, site assessments, some research projects, and training local experts. So what's, what's the key? So our program has been around since 2001, and I think maybe the most important thing we've learned is that it's all about making connections. So it's all, it's all about bringing school district staff together because there's a natural level, level of trust between school district staff that we as govern, government employees just will never reach that level of trust. Um, so we see our role as bringing people together, um, making connections, and then also being able to disseminate information statewide. And so this is a picture from one of our workshops. You can see um, that smile on Mike's face. We like to see those smiles at all of our workshops. Okay, so something we've been doing for a while that bringing people together are our workshops, our school IPM workshops. Um, these are fun and practical events. They are taught by uh, uh, IPM practitioners, professional IPM practitioners like Carlos Segurto you see in this picture, and Phil Boyce is in the white shirt. Um, he's in the white shirt there and leading that pack there. Um, so our workshops, they're designed to, um, they're basically designed to encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning through hands-on activities, um, demonstrations, because we know that our audience, the school district uh, maintenance and operations folks, uh, learn by doing, not necessarily through lectures. So we get people out there, we teach them how to do gopher trapping. I think John might, has been to a few workshops and learned um, some trapping with us too. And then, you know, it's an important opportunity for us to learn from school districts so that we can then um, promote all the good stuff we hear about um, to all the districts statewide. <clears throat> okay, so new endeavor um, that we are doing recently are site assessments, and those have been spearheaded by Ashley Freeman. She's back there. Um, I just have to, I have to say that Ashley's undeniably um, one of the most passionate people about school IPM and children's health th that I've ever met. Um, she also, this probably was her holding this trap and she probably loved seeing all those dead cockroaches on that trap. <laughs> um, but our site assessments, um, they focus on specific pest issues at school districts and they usually have been at the request of the district or through looking at um, PR analysis. So we bring in some UC IPM advisors to help out with our IPM recommendations. This particular, particular school had a major Turkestan uh, cockroach infestation. Um, it's a relatively new species to California. So we had um, Dr. Andrew Sutherland um, come out and help us with some IPM recommendations. Here you can see Ashley um, getting her hands dirty, showing the school how to reduce cockroach habitat. And they also provided the school district with some sanitation recommendations, which you can see this new uh, pest-proof trash can. It's one of the recommendations that the school implemented themselves. Um, like I said, Ashley's very passionate about this, so she got the school really excited too, and they went, up, they took it upon themselves to do an education campaign. And so it's kind of hard to see, but that sticker right there says, don't feed the cockroaches. Mm -hmm. um, that was done by the school district. Um, put all, they put it on all their um, new trash cans. So Ashley also ends our site assessments with a seminar to train all school district staff. And um, some of them are even open to the public um, so if people are interested in learning about school IPM as well. So out of some of these site assessments, we actually have, um, are working on some research projects with UC IPM advisors. Um, 
Dr. Andrew Sutherland is working with that school who had the Turkestan cockroach um, infestation, and he is um, looking into school-specific best management practices um, for dealing with Turkestan cockroaches. Uh, we're also working with uh, Dr. Siabash Charabadi down in Southern California who's looking at red imported fire ant research, um, specifically for schools. And then we're currently in the works with um, Dr. Cheryl Willen and Long Beach Unified to do um, a research project looking at weed management at school sites, um, because we know that's a big issue um, for schools throughout the state. So as part of our site assessments and the research projects, um, we're hoping to take all the information that we learn and put it into a practical, useful format for school districts and then um, share that information statewide. Okay, and also um, part of the site assessments and some other projects is that we're looking to our local school ICAM experts, um, like John, we had him talk today. This is Gabe Sherman from, Unify, from uh, Ukiah Unified. Um, and these are the pe some of the people we've worked with on recent projects who um, we, they basically come to us with a problem or with their success story and we either help them out or we get their um, story and then we share it throughout the state and they're willing to talk to other districts to share their successes. We've also reformatted our school IPM calendar this year so that we actually received pictures and success stories from school districts throughout the state, and those are the feature photos. Um, this one is actually, you might recognize that picture, that's John's um, gopher picture, and we have his uh, quote there, we're trapping with great results, it's awesome. So again, just promoting that success statewide. Um, we also featured in the calendar Riverside Unified, their um, bee swarm traps, they actually work with a local beekeeper um, who rela he relocates and cares for their bee swarms. And we're also proud to share Riverside Unified. Their, um, they received an IPM Achievement Award last year, so we shared their story through our um, e-list. We got actually a number of requests asking if they could talk with the folks at Riverside, so we put them in touch. Um, Riverside, they were even willing to speak at one of our recent workshops. Um, so having those local sc school experts, like we said, there's trust. There's like an innate trust um, between school districts folks. So we see ourselves as being able to make those connections and share those success stories statewide.